Welcome to episode 13 of the Woo Woo Way podcast. My name is Zeb Rice. Today's podcast is an audio version of the sixth in the Sunday teaching series that you can watch on Vimeo. In this episode, George Falcon illustrates how we can live a healthy life through a partnership with our higher self. If we awaken to the truth of our unity with this higher power, our source, we can live the best life possible. In one of my favorite parts in this episode, he uses a model of consciousness versus awareness. It sounds abstract and complicated, but I promise it isn't. In fact, I have to just say that it is super cool. What he's saying is that the trick to mastering ourselves and our reality is to recognize that consciousness is fashioned by us to create our experience. So what we experience as reality and the world around us, we ourselves have modified with our beliefs, thoughts, and emotions. In this consciousness versus awareness model, he's saying something I think truly amazing. He's saying that we have the power over all those elements of the self, the the thoughts, the emotions, the beliefs, and therefore have the power to fashion reality as we wish. We just have to anchor our identity in awareness and accept the power that is ours by definition and witness the perfection of the universe. And it's it's really kind of um, extraordinarily simple, but extraordinarily profound at the same time. And so one of the things I also love about this episode is that he addresses the common question that if everything is so perfect, why does my life suck? And forget about me, what about all the people that really have it bad, like in some war-torn country? That doesn't look so perfect. So I think that what he does a good job of in this episode of explaining is that is that like the the metaphor of the pie that is already baked that he's heard that he's used in other episodes um in this episode he explains that the reality that we are experiencing from moment to moment is like h2o that's already frozen and if we go back up to the level of consciousness where the water is a gas or the pie ingredients are being mixed still to use that that other analogy then we can reshape our future nows. And we do that by remembering who we are, what our power is, and then deciding to use it now, even though the consequences of that power may seem scary to um, to us um, as we mistakenly think of as who we are. So you might listen to this and think that this is really an unfair way to look at it. Uh, it let's just say you know, you've got someone that's in an abusive relationship or you know, someone that's been wrongly imprisoned and tortured. I mean, are they really responsible for creating their own reality? Uh, that's that's one of those hard teachings that I talked about in the in the last episode. Um, and I think that if you asked George that, he would say yes, though maybe they're not, or probably they're they're not consciously uh, responsible or even likely to have created the conditions for the responsibility in this particular lifetime. Furthermore, I think he would say that rather than adding insult to injury with that comment um, for those that are suffering the most, instead, I think that he would argue that it's actually an empowering and hopeful teaching for them, and more hopeful and empowering for them than than actually anyone else. Um, in fact, the, the more you suffer, I think the more hopeful and empowering it is. It, it opens the door for optimism and freedom and an end to suffering. And, and that, that end is within their, their grasp and within their control. So I'm going to hand it straight over to George to share this extraordinary lesson so that you can judge for yourself. Our primary question, which we address every week in one way or another, is why aren't we certain? Why is it not apparent? That we're free. That really is the question, okay? Why isn't it apparent? Why isn't it obvious <laughs> that we're free? So when I say to you that you're going to be detectives, right? You're, you're going to look at the data and you're going to learn to see it in a different way and hopefully as you do that it starts to become more and more apparent. Oh, I see how I'm looking at this data that leads me to make a conclusion that I am not free. I tell you, you're going to be a scientist, right? You're going to say, if this is true, but it looks like this, 
Why does it look like this? And what could I do that would lead me to see it correctly and understand why it does look like this because it really does look like this. So we always start in the same place, which is to verify and to reinforce to you that right now, right here, you are free. You're never going to be more free than you are right now. See, that's it. Right now, right here, you're free. So when I say we're only one agreement away, right? I mean, we're only one agreement. <laughs> if I tell you you're free and all of a sudden it occurs to you with total certitude that you are free, that's the end of it. I mean, see, we're in agreement. But if you have any doubts about it, if it doesn't demonstrate in your daily life, well then we don't have this agreement. We don't agree. We don't have the agreement that we're after. Okay, so. There are two ways to explain things. One is to give you sort of a map. Okay, so philosophically it's called the positive way. So it's sort of like giving you a map, but remember, the map is not the terrain, right? And then there's the, well, how am I going to verify? In other words, I've got to take the trip. See, I'm going to take the trip because the map is only going to tell me what to look for or how close I may be getting to the destination, right? Now, a long time ago, probably except for Greg and I, and, okay, uh, there was a program, very popular program, 20 questions. The rest of you probably never heard of it, okay? <laughs> but it, it was a panel of about four or five people, and they would be, you know, the audience would be told what the subject was or who the person was, and they had to guess either what the subject was or who the person was within 20 questions. If it was a person, they didn't get to see the person. The audience got to see who the person was, but these, the panel didn't. Almost invariably, they got it very quickly because they had figured out a trick, right? They had figured out a trick. And basically the trick was something like this. Ask a question that gets rid of a lot of options. See, ask a question that gets rid of a lot of options. So, one question might be, is it organic or inorganic? Well, it's organic. Do you understand how many questions are already off the board? Anything that's inorganic is no longer a viable guess. Two. Mammal or not? Yes. Woo, see, I mean, they, they had learned to ask questions that minimize the number of choices that were left. So you're going to be like this panel. So one of the first questions you're going to ask is, okay, I am free, right? Yes. Am I phenomenal? No. Do you understand how many options are no longer available to you? You're not phenomenal. So if anything is phenomenal, then it can't be you. I mean, you just got rid of a whole set of options so that we're all clear. What do we mean by phenomenal? What, what makes something phenomenal? Well, a synonym to phenomenal is objective, an object. So objects, phenomena, have characteristics. Well, does a tree have characteristics? Yes. Okay, I can't be a tree. It has attributes. Water flows. Okay, you know, if I can identify an attribute, then it's not me. So characteristics, attributes, form. Well, does the tree, does a dog have a form? Yes, well, it can't be me, see? Because characteristics, objects, have characteristics, attributes, forms, limits. Now, however big a mountain is, it still has a limit, right? I mean, it's that big. See, it's not as big as the universe. Does it have limits? Is it subject to time, space, and notion? Is it affected by time? Is a mountain affected by time? Yes. We know, for instance, you know that the Appalachian Mountains on the east side of the United States at one time were bigger than the Rocky Mountains. They have eroded. They're not as big anymore. See? They have been affected by time and other energy patterns, but 
basically, objects are affected by time, space, and motion. Energy, electricity, magnetism, gravity. Objects are affected by these things. So what should you conclude about yourself? Well, obviously, if I am affected by time, then I'm not an object. I'm sorry, if I'm affected by time, I am an object, okay? Now, in the history of this process that we call awakening or the spiritual path, that first clue was developed thousands of years ago. The master started teaching exactly what I'm trying to tell you right now, okay? Another characteristic of objects is they have a beginning. So are bodies born? Yes, you see, so that's a beginning. So they're gonna have a duration and they're gonna have an end. Then whatever you are, since you're not an object, you're not phenomenal, you don't have a beginning. Since you don't have a beginning, you don't have an end. See, you're gonna be like this panel. You're gonna get rid of viable options to put yourself in a position to remember your original state. Now, we call it the original state, which is a misnomer, because your state hasn't changed. <laughs> okay, so it hasn't changed. But we call it original because it's where you started to veer off the truth about yourself, even though that could never ultimately be correct about you. You're right now what you are, what you've been, and what you will always be. In a practical way of saying it is, you're free. You're clear, pure. So anything that you can see, hear, touch, and doesn't fit that category, you say, well, that's not me. So again, remember I said, one way of saying things is what we call the positive approach, which is like a map, right? So what is one of the biggest issues to the human race? Death. Death. Okay? Death is one of the biggest issues to the human race. Well, can what I call you die? No. My goodness, if you recognize that, you would never generate depression, fear, anger, wanting. You would get rid of all of those. You would never generate those sensibilities. Depression, fear, anger, wanting. Why? Because you had resolved it. Since I had no beginning, I will have no end. Then why do I have to strive, stress, to survive? Does that mean that you will neglect the body? No, because the body, right, has a beginning, has a duration, and has an end. So guess what? You're actually going to take better care of your body but not because you're trying to survive, because it makes total sense that the greater care you take of the body, the better it can serve you for the original purpose that you created it. I mean, you created it for a purpose, and then you create problems within your own creation, and now you're so bogged down with dealing with the problems that you've created that you don't even have the opportunity to use it as you originally intended it to be used. Once you resolve the issue, hey, survival is not an issue to me. You will never generate depression, fear, anger, or wanting. Because you are such that there's nothing missing. See, the realization, the recognition of that would remove all wanting. There's nothing missing in you. Now, the other part isn't as attractive. By the way, there's nothing you can gain, okay? Since there's nothing missing, there's nothing you can gain, but it's okay because you don't need it. Resolving the issue of the fact that you are not phenomenal, you are not an object, already is going to help you Recognize your freedom. 
Okay? So again, does the body have characteristics? Yes. Coloration, size, etc. Attributes? Yes. Does it have form? Yes. Does it have limits? Yes. Well, I guess I can't be the body. Whoa, wait a minute. Isn't that who we think we are? We think we're the body. And even if you don't consciously, which is even worse, even if you don't consciously think you're the body, if you're actually paying attention to your thinking and your actions, you would come to recognize what? You are thinking and behaving as if you were the body. Okay? Now, as you identify with the body, you identify with the history of the body, you identify with the attributes of the body, the characteristics, right? And you conceptually derive at a matrix. Now, you don't call it a matrix, you call it yourself. Okay? You call it yourself. And by the way, once you assign something to yourself, it's near impossible to let go of it. Whatever attribute, whatever characteristic you assign to yourself, it's near impossible to let go of it. I've given you this example, I think, before, but let me give it to you again. I was talking to this young man, and we just happened to be outside in this little cafe area. And I said to him, so how would you describe yourself? He said, I'm responsible, hardworking, dependable. I said, good. Okay. So I said, now, you see that young lady over there? Very attractive young lady. I want you to walk over there to her. Neither one of us know. We don't know her. How long would it take you to convince her you were this free spirit, roguish man about town? He said, oh, I couldn't do that. I said, why not? I'm not that. I said, okay. How long would it take you to convince her that you're dependable, hardworking, and reliable? He said, about 10 minutes. <laughs> See, he was so convinced he was those attributes, he could sell them. But attributes that he had not assigned to himself, he couldn't sell. Now, again, some of these attributes that you have assigned to yourself actually, under certain circumstances, start working against you. Okay? They start working against you. And that's why, by the way, from a practical point of view, how do you know what to buy to, for someone? They're predictable. I mean, unless you haven't been paying attention, Right, Joe? You know what Maria likes. So, I mean, you're not going to buy something that the other person, I mean, if you've been around them for a while, isn't going to like. I mean, they're going to. <laughs> I hit something. <laughs> That's why I chose Joe. <laughs> you see what I'm getting at, right? I mean, if we've been paying attention, right, we would say, well, no, uh, he, she isn't going to wear this. It's, they're just not going to wear this. I mean, that's not something they would buy for themselves. That's not something they would enjoy. So, you see, if we were not predictable, to whatever degree, right? If we were not predictable, how could we buy each other gifts? How could we recommend a particular restaurant, right? So I say, oh, ours, this is great organic, you know, raw restaurant. They just opened it up on West Side. He's going, okay, right? <laughs> He's on a different path now, but I, <laughs> I was talking to the old Aris. <laughs> but by the way, <laughs> but by the way, I mean, even a simple thing like that, changing a diet, doesn't it take conscious effort? Right? And after you've actually started this new diet, uh, don't you still have pull for some of the old items? Yes, I mean, you see, we, we have these attachments because they become part of our identity, okay? But again, something as simple as a diet. We think in a particular way, okay? Now, we have an engineer in the group, right? 
boy, it's easy to say, okay, this is the way I have to present the data to that person. If I present the data to this person, they're going to get it because their brain has been trained to process information and organize it in a particular way. If you're a lawyer, I mean, you see, we have trained the brain to process information in a particular way. If it's not presented that way, it doesn't make sense to us. Okay? So you have created limits and imposed them on your creation, which you call the self. And then you're trying to substitute duration for that which you are. By that I mean, you're trying to keep the self going. Okay? And that's why you don't want it to change, because if you do, are you the same self that started? Well, now, you know, if now you're a different self, then did the old self die? And that's why it's so hard to change the way you think. And so I'm always stressing, pay attention to the premise of your thoughts. Okay? Now, what's the premise? Actually, there's several, but the, the outstanding premise of dysfunctional thinking. Summarize it even better than that. That's true. He, she, it did it to me. Powerless. I'm powerless. That's why I'm a victim, because I'm powerless. He, she, it did it to me, and there's nothing I can do about it. That is the major premise of dysfunctional thinking. I am powerless. Okay? So, are we going to find blaming? Yep. Of course. Yeah, I've got to blame somebody, right? See, because that, this which is happening, certainly I would not have created it, so somebody else did it to me. Okay? All right. What is the major premise of somebody in recovery? Now, remember, recovery means you stop doing the other thing, right? You, you stop thinking on the basis of being powerless. So what's the major premise of recovery thinking? Taking responsibility. Taking responsibility. And it's even okay to say, I'm not sure how I did this to myself, <laughs> but at least I'll say I did it to myself. And maybe in saying that, maybe in taking the the blame, <laughs> maybe in taking the credit for the creation, I may figure out how I did it to myself. How did I attract this, okay? How do I keep my good from appearing to me? How is it that I'm doing it? You see, you've already changed your frame of reference. You have a better chance of starting to understand what it is that you're doing because you're taking responsibility for what's happening in your life. Now, look at the medical model. Does the medical model start by assigning the responsibility to the patient? Depends on the doctor. Depends on the doctor. I stand corrected. <laughs> we have one exception, almost two of them now, okay? No, aren't we looking for a virus? Aren't we looking for, uh, see, we don't start, unless you're like them, right? By saying, okay, Christy, why, why are you creating headaches? Okay. <laughs> you see, we don't start there. We don't start by saying, okay, are you willing to take responsibility for that which you are, quote unquote, suffering? In fact, part of our work is what? Until you get sick and tired of being sick, you're not going to get well. You actually have to get sick and tired of being sick before you start getting well, because guess what? You say, okay, I'm not going to do this anymore. You may not be that clear, but you're basically saying, okay, that's the end of this. What do I do now? So the outstanding characteristic of recovery is to start to take responsibility. What is it I'm doing? What is it I'm saying? What is it I'm not doing? What is it I'm not saying that has created this situation that I'm in? Okay, well, what's the outstanding characteristic of what we call a healthy way of thinking? A partnership, a cooperation with your source. Whatever you call that source, okay? you can call it the universe, you can call it God, whatever you want to call it, your higher power, it doesn't matter. It's just a partnership <coughs> with something greater than yourself. And by the way, a very smart partnership is between yourself and you. 
I'll say it again. A very wise partnership is between yourself and you. You don't even have to go outside of you. Okay, but if you're not ready to do that, at least start out with an external source and hopefully you'll back into, oh yes, that which I call you <laughs> is the source and the self is the recipient, the end result of a process, of a process. I'm going to tell you something very valuable. I'm going to tell you something variable, very valuable. Things look the way they do because of the way you're looking at them. Things look the way they do because of the way you're looking at them. That which you see is what you are perceiving. Okay? That which you see is what you're perceiving. If you don't like what you're perceiving, what would be a wise thing to do? <laughs> Change the way you perceive. Okay? Well, how are you going to do it? Change the premise of your thinking. See? Change the premise of your thinking. So, in a healthy way of thinking, you have created a interaction, a partnership, a relationship. Now, wisdom would dictate, right, that hopefully you'd say, well, you know, that which I'm going to create this partnership with is either wiser, more powerful, more experienced. So that one will take the lead. I'll be the junior partner in this partnership, okay? I won't try to lead. So let's just take a conventional model, okay? Religion, prayer, okay? Now, in that relationship, so people pray. Is the junior partner trying to take over? Yes. So today, Aris gets to play God. Aris, I need a job, okay? <laughs> Let me tell you what kind of job I need and how much, right? Instead of saying, Aris, what do I need? And he says, George, you need to change your emotions. And what about the job, Aris? No, 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 change your emotions. Okay, I don't see how changing my emotions has anything to do with the job. But if I do change my emotions, will I be surprised that the job appears? Mm -hmm. I will be surprised that the job appears, right? Because I don't know how the process works yet. So if you're going to have a partnership, good advice is be the junior partner. <laughs> don't tell the senior partner what it is you want, <laughs> when you want it, what it has to look like. Because don't be surprised if your senior partner vetoes the request. <laughs> Why? And having more wisdom, it says, ah, you would go in the wrong direction. That, that, that would be the worst thing that could happen to you. Because you see, I can see the sequence of events if I give you that. Believe me, you're not going to like that. Do this. But the self doesn't have the ability to see into the future, so it cannot see beyond its immediate want lack. Okay? So, as you pay attention to yourself, which I've said to you before, you need to study your self. Okay? When I say that, I want, to study, I want you to study the self as you would study any animal, for instance. See? You're going to see what it does. Now, I've said to you before, there's a person that is known as the dog whisperer. There's another person that's known as the cat whisperer. How did they get good? They studied. One of them dogs, the other one cats. And they saw certain tendencies and certain abilities, and pretty soon they said, oh, okay, I think I understand the nature of these animals. Well, if you don't study yourself, how are you going to deduce, oh, this animal has a tendency to think this way, has a tendency to emote this way, has a tendency to do these things. Now I can help it. So you're going to study the self. Now, one of the things we do, remember I've said, when we say it in the positive form, it's a map. But then I said to get the recognition, to remember, we actually do the opposite. It's no longer in the positive form. 
So for a long time, masters taught the student, just like that panel, right? Get rid of that which you are not, obviously. Phenomenal. But then after time, they realize, whoa, 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 these students are now creating another experience. They believe to be the ultimate truth, but it's just another phenomena. Absence. Absence. They were now creating the experience of absence and thinking that that was the goal. So, I've used this example with you before. We're going to have several bags, okay? So, we've got this bag over here. And this bag contains every thought and its corresponding counterpart. Okay? Yin, yang, up, down, smooth, rough. Every concept has a counterpart. Now, again, because we're very sloppy, we only deal with one part of the pair. We, we don't look for the other part. Because if you started looking for the other part, you'd see it was there. So in the presence of misery, what's also there? Joy. But we get so focused on one part of the pair that we totally neglect the presence of the other part. We get so focused on yang that we totally neglect the presence of yin. Okay? So one bag then contains every pair of concepts. Now, what did the masters realize? Okay, everybody wanted to escape samsara and seek nirvana. But the nirvanic experience they were having was not what they were talking about. The experience they were having and calling it nirvanic was the second bag. What's in the second bag? Nothing. Empty. Absence. We're going to turn this bag, which by the way, it looks exactly like the first one. We're going to turn it upside down and nothing falls out. The students were actually creating that experience, believing they had actually arrived at the ultimate goal. Because the mind can create the experience relative to the first bag, relative to the second bag. So one of the first individuals who started to emphasize the third bag is the one we know as Buddha, Gautama. He said, okay, look, there's this third bag. What's in the third bag? The absence, the absolute absence of what's in the first bag and the second bag. That's what's in the third bag. The absolute absence of what's in the first bag. So are there any concepts in this bag? No. Is it empty? No, because that's the second bag. See, he was trying to get the student to stop creating emptiness, voidness. Because the mind can create that as an experience. So he started to teach the double negative, the absence of an absence. The absolute absence of an absence. Well, we're at that point that we now have another realization. You gotta let go of all three bags. You gotta let go of all three bags. And now you've put yourself in your original state. That's how you do it. But what are you looking for? Remember, it's a map that you're free, clear, pure. That there is nothing about you that could ever be trapped. There is nothing about you that could ever be depleted, added to. That that which you are is such that everything that is, is in you and upon you. Everything. That which is happening is within you. Upon you. But you're not it. You're not that which is happening. Because that's phenomenal. 
You're like the background. You're like the ground upon which things grow from. A popular model was a mirror. Well, why was it a popular model? Well, because the mirror is here and it reflects anything in front of it. But the images in the mirror are not what is being reflected. So the mirror became a very popular model. But then another problem occurred. See, once you see the history of the process of, of waking up, you recognize that for a while things are going in a certain way and then somebody comes along and says, oh, no, 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 no. We've created another problem. Okay, now we've got to solve the problem that we've created. See, now we've got to solve the problem that we created. Why? Because a tradition arose and people were busily wiping the mirror clean. So Nang comes along <laughs> and he says, no, 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 no. Guys, there is no mirror. And there is no dust. So what the heck are you doing? Wiping the mirror clean. But there appears to be a mirror. There appears to be dust. And there appears to be someone wiping the mirror. And how are these appearances created? Through the process of perception. That's how they're created. And all, all of you perceive, whether you do it consciously or not, is irrelevant. But you are generating your experiences. Now remember, a model is like a map. It isn't the terrain. Okay? It just hopefully points to something that uh, you'll be looking for. Okay? You know, look for it. Earlier I said, that we're very sloppy with words. And the unfortunate thing is that there's not enough players, even as many of you that are here, we would have to start developing our own language, our own vocabulary. So we're stuck with using the words that are already available to us and trying to modify and say, okay, we're gonna use them like this, okay? Because otherwise it's gonna throw us off. So we're gonna use two words that are used in everyday vocabulary interchangeably. I don't want you to use them interchangeably. From now on, relative to what we're doing here, not, not out there for the average person, I want you to start seeing consciousness and awareness as different. I want you to start seeing consciousness and awareness as different. Now in everyday language, in everyday life, these two words are used interchangeably. And it's okay. They're not after accuracy. See, that's the thing. In, in the conversation of everyday life, we're not that concerned with accuracy, so to use the word consciousness or aware is okay. But you need to be very concerned with accuracy. Okay? So I'm going to give you a model. Just again, just to help you start the process, because the important thing is for what? For you to start doing things consciously. I don't know how you're going to take responsibility if you're doing things unconsciously. And I say, Aris, why did you say that? And he says, said what? <laughs> well, don't you understand that that was dysfunctional? Yesterday I'm talking to this man and I said, don't you recognize that's an excuse? He said, really? I said, yes, that's an excuse. <laughs> I mean, he didn't even, and he's pretty smart, by the way. I mean, it's not like, you know. Why? Well, because he didn't say to himself, I'm going to make up an excuse. He just made a statement. But the statement was, re re sorry, in reality, an excuse. All right, consciousness. The reason experiences seem real, the reason experiences seem real, real is because awareness and consciousness are like bookends. Every experience is the modification of consciousness. 
Therefore, when you are conscious of fear, it seems very real. You have modified consciousness to give you the experience of fear. Awareness. Awareness is like a witness, an observer. It's not involved in this process, it's just a witness. So is it going to experience fear? No. Is it going to be aware of fear? Yes. But it's not experiencing it because it's not consciousness. Okay? Now later on I'm going to tell you how they evolve, how they differentiate it. But for right now, every experience is related to consciousness and that's why it seems so real to you. If you take the position of awareness, they will not seem real. Because from this position, they are not real. From this position, they are real. <laughs> so that distinction has to start to become clear. That what I call you is the witness. And yourself is consciousness. All right, so what's between the two of them? Your beliefs, your thinking, your emotions, and your body. That's what's between the two of them. So what is conditioning your consciousness? Your beliefs, your thoughts, your emotions, and your actions. If you're not paying attention to those things, how will you ever be able to take responsibility for the outcome. You have to start seeing the difference. What I call you is the witness. Your experience is consciousness fashioned, formed as the experience. Therefore, by the time it's become your experience, it's like taking water H2O, making it water, putting it in an ice tray, put it in the freezer, and now you got an ice cube. See, by the time it becomes an experience, it's like an ice cube. That's why it seems so real and hard. But if you were dealing at it with a gas level, boy, it's so, so easy to change. It's so easy to change. So as you move your awareness up to scale, you're starting to recognize, oh, I can see where this process is going. I better modify it right now. Better modify it because I'm going to end up with an ice cube. And then it will be solid. It will be real. It'll be very difficult to change. I've got to start changing it here. And then I won't end up with that. Okay? So for us, we're going to use these two words differently. Awareness represents you as the witness, as the observer. Consciousness represents the experience. So now, where does it get tricky? The darn thing is that it always gets tricky. Somewhere along the way, it's going to get tricky, okay? Because I keep saying to you, there must be something about the whole process that allows us to make a mistake. Otherwise, everybody would be fully awakened and we wouldn't have to have lessons, okay? There must be something that happens that allows us to make a mistake. That that which is not real appears to be real, and that which is real appears to be invisible non-existence. Because once you start to get the knack again, you won't make the mistake again. Now you can play the game as a game. See? Now you can play it for fun. Now you're playing with the house money. But right now, most people are playing a game as if life and death was at stake. Okay? As if life and death was at stake. All right. So consciousness gets fashioned, right, to give us the experience. So it's solid now at that level, at the level of awareness. You're able to modify anything, transmute anything. 
keep it going, stop it, whatever you want. You have all the choices at that level. But as it proceeds down in frequency, again, gets more solid, more real, if you wish, okay? And therefore, more difficult to change it. Well, that's what you did with the body and the self. That's what you did with the body and the self. Your original body, your original body is clear, pure, infinite, like H2O. Then you made it water, and then you put it in an ice tray, then you put it in a freezer, and voila, there it is, solid. There it is, solid. Okay? Now, you know, John of the Gospels had a tremendous insight. Got mistranslated, by the way, but a tremendous insight. So I'll give you the original understanding of, the, of what was said, and maybe just to remind you, some of you that are familiar. So let's start out with a familiar. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word became flesh. But what he said was, in the beginning, now you have to assume the mentality, the frame of reference of the Greeks. In the beginning was the Logo, and the Logo was divine. And the Logo slowed up and appeared as physical. So guess what your job is? To take the physical and raise the frequency. until it's like the logo. Okay? Now, once you reverse the process, because this time you're doing it consciously, oh, you can run up and down the scale anytime you want. <laughs> you move up and down the scale because you've realized what it is you did, you realize how you did it. So when I say to you, with every level of consciousness that you move up, you gain choices. When we say that someone thinks in a dysfunctional way, they don't see choices. They don't see choices. I mean, it's amazing how often people will say, well, there's nothing I can do. And you say, well, look, you could do this, you could do that, you could do that. No, no, I can't do that. Why couldn't you? And guess what? The first thing they'll do is come up with an excuse. I can't do this because, I can't do that because, I can't do that because. And then what do you do? You say, okay, do you have the power to do it if you didn't have the excuse? And guess what? You have the power to do it. Okay? If you get rid of the excuse, you'll recognize you have the power to do it. So again, the pattern of what we call the dysfunctional thinking is you don't see options. The more you move up, the more options seem to be present. And the more how to attract those options, not even create them, how to attract those options, how to put yourself in that frequency that you're one with that option becomes apparent. And that's why your life should get better and better and better. Because when I say to you, to tell you these principles, and for you not to take them to the marketplace, it's just a nice afternoon we've spent talking. <laughs> but if you can grasp the principle and apply it to your life, it should change your circumstances. So when I say to you to get rid of dysfunctional thinking, when I ask you, can you, what do I want to hear? Because yes. at least you're affirming what? I must have the power. See, so if I say, can you, you should say yes. By the way, the next question is going to be what? Will you use it? <laughs> will you use it? <laughs> See, will you use your power? 
Well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, I'd have to change jobs and I'd have to, you know, no, I don't think I'll use my power. But hopefully you would say what? Yes. So then what's the third question? When? <laughs> when will you use your power? How about right now? Okay? Again, you've sold yourself a belief that power and you are two different things. You've bought that belief. It isn't true, but if it's your belief, it will manifest, right? It will condition consciousness to give you the experience that in fact you are powerless. If you change your belief, you will change consciousness, you will change the experiences. So when I say to you, it's very important to study the self. How are you going to correct the self if you don't study it? I was telling some of you, probably the ones I saw Saturday, because it happened Saturday, right? I was walking down the street to a corner in this direction, and in this direction was this man, and I looked down, and he was walking in this direction. And all of a sudden, I became aware there's this beautiful little dog, just lovely little dog. Okay? And I thought, wow, I wonder if he belongs to that man, but the distance between them was too great. You know, the, the man was like halfway down the block, and this dog is right next to me. And so the dog starts walking parallel with me. And I thought, whoa, I wonder who he belongs to, or she, I wonder who this dog belongs to, and have I just inherited a dog, okay? Because I, mean, I can't let this little dog run out into the street, right? So, okay? And as I'm trying to process this, I hear, and the dog stops. I went, oh, this is good, this is good. And the dog turns around and walks toward the man. Yourself! is unfortunately unlike that little dog. <laughs> That's the unfortunate part, okay? When you go, it just goes, oh yeah. <laughs> That's not what I want to do, okay? Again, in driving around, I'm always surprised how many dogs are walking their owners. Ever noticed that? I mean, it's actually the dog that's walking the owner, right? I mean, it chooses where it's going to go and all this, okay? There's very few. I mean, this was outstanding. I wish I had, had time. I really would have liked to have talked to him and said, geez, how did you learn to do this? And what do you do in life? Because this person has to be different. And how easy would it be, if he's not, how easy would it be for this person to really make a lot of advancements on the spiritual path? Relatively easy. Because if he could recognize that his self, sometimes psychologically we call it the subconscious, it's the same energy pattern as the dog. And he knows how to train the dog. He could train his subconscious. You have that power. You have that ability. So, as I sometimes say, wouldn't it be wonderful if you woke up tomorrow and you said, you know, today is a good day to study depression. So I'm going to be depressed all day long, okay? I'm going to tell my dog to generate depression because I want to study depression, right? I want to see what it does in the body. What does it do to my digestive system? What does it do to my outlook relative to other people? So I'm going to study depression. I'm going to take notes. And then at 7 o'clock at night, you say, okay, that's enough. Stop. Gone. Or do we find ourselves depressed? And sometimes we don't even call it depression, right? We use a synonym, like sad. See, we use a synonym. We, we don't even call it depression. But my main point is what? Did you choose the feeling? And invariably the answer is going to be what? No. It chose me. <laughs> and I agreed. Imagine 
recapturing your ability, your power to choose what it is you want your dog to generate for you. Now, do you notice that when we meditate, don't I say, open your eyes and what? Be as happy as you will allow yourself to be. Why do I say that? Because you're the one that sets the upper limit on how good you're going to feel. And all of you have a good reason for how good you will allow yourself to feel. Everybody has good reasons for how good they're going to allow themselves to feel. Okay? When in fact, there's no cap on how good you could feel. All right, any questions? All right, then let's do a fast exercise, okay? Because ultimately, remember I told you, positive is just the model, tells you what to look for, then you're gonna do something, and so your assignment for the week is to identify that which is phenomenal, so how will you identify that which is phenomenal? It will have characteristics, attributes, forms, limits. It can be affected by time, space, and motion. And as soon as you detect it's phenomenal, the conclusion has to be what? That's not me. Okay? That's what you're going to do. Hopefully. Right? You're going to study phenomena, and you're going to say, okay, as soon as I identify it as phenomena, it's not me. So when I say to you, we start out with, ridiculous, simple examples, because if we can get it, hopefully the principle will guide us when it gets a little more complex, a little more uh, subtle, okay? All right, any questions? Well, all I can tell you is what? Practice, practice, practice. Study the self, practice relaxing. So that's it for today. Thanks for listening. If you've enjoyed the podcast, I would like to invite you to tell your friends about it and share it on social media. If you could leave a review of it on iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you downloaded it from, that would help others find it. And finally, for any feedback or if you'd like to find out more information on Wu Wu Wei and George Falcon, you can go to the website, www.falconteachings.com. Follow Falcon Teachings on social media outlets such as Twitter, Instagram, or Pinterest. Or shoot us an email at falconteachings at gmail.com. Thanks as always for listening. We'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.